Hi, everybody. Um, hope you all had a good lunch. Give everybody a few more minutes. So we might have some people trickling in, but going to go ahead and get started. So we have a lot to go over. Um, so I wanted to cover the new era of ASO. There were some talks earlier about some of the changes coming out for Apple and Google and how that's changing ASO. Um, ASO is not keywords anymore, things like that, which has been the way it's been done for a while. But more recently, I think there's been a lot of changes that deeply impact how to do ASO. So I wanted to cover that. Um, so some info about me. My name is David Quinn. I'm one of the co-founders of Gummy Cube. I joined in 2011. Um, I've got 18 years of experience in mobile in one degree or another. So working from ringtones and wallpapers on Motorola razors uh, all the way to this. So uh, I'm familiar with evolution of things. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the latest one. So going to go over ASO then and now, um, involving the latest data and structures. So conceptually, ASO then and now, and then some specifics about the data to look at, the structures to look at, some strategies to look at with that data and the structure, and uh, how to get into really thinking about it and where it's going. So for then versus now, um, metadata optimization, keyword optimization, Oftentimes, further back, less frequently now, um, I still get people that come up to the booths and say, hey, so you guys do keywords? Like, yes, but uh, there's also all these other things that go into ASO. Um, another core component that is still fundamental is creative optimization. Um, so you need people to find you. You need to convert those people. And that goes for not just organic channels, but paid channels. This is sort of basic core ASO that hasn't gone away, but is not a growth hack anymore. It's fundamental to what you need to do. Then adding these new capabilities are becoming and now fundamental what you need to do. Custom product pages, um, product page optimization, in-app events, and then the different placements in ASA experimenting with those, which can vary from app to app and budget to budget. On the Google Play side, similar concepts, but with GA. <clears throat> and then um, Custom store listings instead of custom product pages like Apple has. A lot of these things are analogous. Apple and Google have always kind of been following each other and doing trends, and that could be hardware or software. But the two different stores kind of have these analogous things that show different metrics and are executed in different ways, like custom store listing, the promo content being analogous to in-app events. Um, Google's quality benchmarks and looking at how those changes are pretty critical, too. Um, and they announced it I.O. in 2018, but at the latest I.O., they announced more changes and more emphasis on what app quality means and how it affects your apps. So got to grow the strategies with the store, but doesn't mean you can sleep on the classic stuff. <clears throat> so the new data on the App Store. Um, how many of you here have used these new conversion benchmarks that Apple provides or looked at them across show of hands? Enthusiastic hands? Yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. So the conversion benchmarks are a good metric to look at, and you should check your app against um, what is provided in the conversion benchmarks. But with this data and with all the other data that's coming out, because there's so many new things, um, looking at it and saying, I'm going to compare my conversion rate, um, what they mean by conversion rate is kind of different than what traditionally you would look at for conversion rates. So the read downloads metric didn't come out until uh, September of 21, I think it was, with the data going back to August. So they're looking at total download conversion rates, which is different than what you would have been looking at for impression volume and first-time download volume. Um, <clears throat> with this one, it's looking at your unique impressions compared to your total downloads. So the numbers you might have been looking at for one reason, like new user acquisitions, are going to be different than what these benchmarks are telling you about your total user conversion rate, which includes re-downloads. And you can't partition them out in the benchmarks. And you can really only look at your category that you're in and your subcategory and the monetization model that you have. So if you're trying to use these conversion benchmarks to see how other apps in the industry are doing, um, it's not partitioned by territory or by traffic source. It's kind of giving you total download information for the category you're in, for the monetization model that you're in. But you might be seeing these conversion benchmarks change significantly, uh, or not the benchmarks, but your metrics compared to them if you suddenly start driving a bunch of user acquisition that you hadn't before, and those users behave differently and convert differently. Um, and it might look like that ratio is going up or down. 
um, but it could just be a measure of your impression volume changing and the types of users that you're driving in. So looking at this data as a starting point is important so you can see how you're doing in the industry, but you have to look at app analytics and really see like, is my impression volume driving this ratio up or my downloads actually going up even though my conversion rate is going down? Um, why is that happening? Is it my traffic source? Is it a creative that I did? Um, so really looking at this new data, but not just going like, hey, I'm, I'm over here, <clears throat> this is good, and calling it a day. Um, you kind of want to really understand with this and Apple Analytics what's going on. Um, they also report on proceeds per paying user, crash rates, retention. So that's also good too, uh, the retention rates in particular. Um, a lot of this activity, including moving from just new user downloads to total downloads and re-downloads, um, and then the retention benchmarks that Apple gives, along with in-app events, which I'll cover in a sec, going more towards current users and lapsed users. A lot of what Apple is emphasizing is on engagement, recapturing older users. App Store's been around for over a decade. People have had the same Apple IDs that have those apps on them. Uh, so you need to find new things to tell them about your app if it's been around that long and keep them around. Um, the metrics are reflecting that transition, so your ASO strategy needs to incorporate it too. So know what it is and know what it isn't when you're comparing yourself. Uh, Google, how many people here have a Google Play app and have tried to look at the data in the last year and they change what it means <laughs> all the time? Yeah, so <clears throat> for me, uh, I did like this change. Google made a change in November where they took Google Ads out of the different channels that it would go to based on where it was going. So like your YouTube would be third party and the placements in search would go to search and then the other placements that weren't searches would go into explore. But then you have this kind of layer of paid going on in your otherwise organic channels that you kind of have to figure it's there, I didn't change much to it, I can reasonably see that this is my organic uh, metrics. Then in November they said all of Google Ads is going to third party. So good, now we have all organic searches and then we have everything else that's not a search and explore. And then in February uh, <laughs> they made navigational searches and categorical searches uh, into search and explore. The featured placements are also in Explore, and then the paid and external traffic, that's all still uh, in third party. Um, but that's a big change to make the, more or less the brand-based searches go into search, and then the other nav or, uh, categorical searches, feature-based searches going into Explore while keeping in those um, featured placements while also adding in their new promotional content. So if you're a part of the beta program, Promo content is a great way to get the app out there. Um, it's actually a better way to get new user downloads than in-app events are. In-app events, relatively small amount of uh, new user downloads compared to what you would get uh, on the Google promo content. Um, they're both good uh, and can get new users, but the ratio of new user acquisitions you can get from Google's uh, program is uh, much higher. Um, so when you're doing your updates, looking to see what am I getting navigationally from my brand and categorically from my feature-based searches, um, have a few slides on how to go about thinking about that. Because search being brand and categorical being feature-based isn't always the same thing from some of the data we've seen. Um, Google doesn't put the same word in the same one all the time. It moves between the two. Um, so when you're looking at the performance of ASO, it's no longer just how is search doing. There's search and explore. And how is that doing from the promo content I'm doing, the keywords that are feature-based that I'm updating, how is my explore trending? And also, could some of that be qualified as search under Google's eyes? They give you limited information on some of the keywords that you rank for. Um, but we also have our data cube tech that lets you see the other terms that are more long tail that you rank for. Um, a lot of them bundled under the other category where they don't tell you what's going on. Um, so those are important to look out for. So it was nice for November to February, golden age, but then they, uh, they did this. So just got to keep up with it. So for the presentation on search types, um, this presentation on Google isn't totally different than it has been for a couple of years, but just thinking about this search and explore change, 
branded searches for your main brand, a lot of your download volume for both platforms is going to come from your brand name, especially if you have a big brand, right? It's kind of obvious, I don't need to have a slide about that. Um, but for competitor searches, I think that one is a bit different. Um, when you're running Apple search ads, you might see that you're getting a lot of uh, top of funnel and even down funnel positive metrics from running a brand, uh, competitor brand focused campaign, um, which is good on search ads. Like if your best fiends here, if you're competing with them, you can buy, you can be Harry Potter and magically buy your way to the top. Um, or you can be friend stars here and rank number two organically right below it. And it's more or less one swipe away. But if you're on the Play Store and you search for best fiends, best fiends show up, then there's the ads and you gotta keep swiping. And then eventually you see the organic results. Um, and from that limited data you do get on Google, the amount of download volume that you get from competitor brands on Google is not one-to-one -one like it is on the App Store. Plus, you can't put them in a hidden keyword field because that doesn't exist on Google. So thinking about Google and Apple the same way and doing the same strategies isn't going to work, and this is one of the examples. Like They simply don't look the same. This is why some of the A-B tests that you do on Apple versus Google uh, might not convert the same way. Presentation is totally different. Um, the main thing is core terms. So core meaning feature-based keywords, the ones that go into explore. Um, your brand is something that you can get because it's your name and maybe you get some long tail based on the keywords that you focus on. But feature-based terms are the ones that you can actively optimize for. So you can write them in your description. You can do some market research to see what your competitors rank for and see if that changes how Google indexes you, same with Apple. Um, but these are the ones that you want to optimize for, measure, explore on. The competitor searches, um, some of them drive in volume, but by and large, it's going to be brand and core. <clears throat> um, In-app events, how many of you have run at least one in-app event and were confused by how many <laughs> downloads you got from new users? So a lot of these don't drive new user downloads. And you need to get five new user downloads to have it show anything at all. And then suddenly it's like, oh, I'm seeing a, you know, a few hundred, a few thousand re-downloads, app opens, that sort of thing. Um, even if you set it to target first-time users, um, from what we've seen, it's different from app to app too. Running it one certain way with the same criteria is not going to be the same in every category with every type of app. And you have to think about the life of the app too. Like if you've had an app that launched a week ago and you're running an in-app event and it's only showing to lapsed and current users, probably nobody's gonna see it. They're probably gonna see the screenshots versus if you have an app that's five years old, a lot of people have it already. Most of them are gonna be able to see the in-app event in search results. Um, so I'd say the lifetime of the app is a factor to consider. If you have an app that's been around for a few years and you're looking to re-engage them, um, if you're like Netflix and don't have an in-app event, you see nothing. If you're like Hulu here, uh, you may say, oh, I, you know, I got Hulu during the pandemic and Netflix. I have all these streaming apps, but I'm looking for something else. And they didn't get Disney Plus. They would see that and go, oh, that's cool. I'll try that out. But if they see Hulu and go, I, don't, I didn't know they had that content, then they might re-engage with it. So that's sort of the whole purpose of the in-app events, um, to regain your awareness um, in search results. But also, they appear on the Apps and Games tab. And this is sort of what Google's promotional content is following up on now. Um, it's a way to be featured to users who have engaged with an app like yours without going through Apple's editorial featuring. It's sort of automatic based on what the uh, user interacted with previously. So it's not just these two placements in search results, it's also showing up as browse traffic essentially on the apps in the games tab where you can re-engage those users. Um, it, it's also a way to make your paid UA efficient. Um, I think custom product pages are more thought of when people are doing this, where you can take a custom product page URL and uh, put it on your paid campaign, drive users to that, it's more relevant, makes sense. But you can do this with in-app events too. They make uh, unique URLs automatically for those, and you can drive users based on email lists you have or your social campaigns, things like that directly to an in-app event if you have a piece of content that's new and uh, seasonal maybe, something like that, more ephemeral than a CPP would be with uh, different features that are gonna be there for a while. 
Um, and we've seen lower CVR, uh, sorry, lower CPI and higher CVR on those. So think about in-app events, not just for their search presence, but also their browse presence and their effect on your paid. Okay, CPPs, we've been talking about those. Um, so this came up at a couple of the other talks today, um, but targeting segmented demographics, reaching out to those individual users, your app does multiple things, and users are searching for those things, and you can run a search ads campaign to emphasize those most basic use case. Um, but when you're running those campaigns, you can see which ones have the best engagement, the most down funnel, if you have an attribution tool hooked up, lowest CPI, things like that. And you can base your ASO strategy around how that's doing, test that out, see if you're able to rank organically for those keywords. Um, so incorporating that, even though it's an ASA paid strategy into your ASO, is a tool that everybody has now. And if you're not doing it, you're gonna fall behind. You're not gonna get that data back on what works best for your app, so definitely looking at doing that. Um, <clears throat> using it for A-B testing. So PPO is just one tool for A-B testing, but you can take the keywords that you're ranked organically well for, um, reasonable proxy for your organics, like your brand name, uh, top rank feature-based keywords, just getting a good mix of terms, putting that into an ad group, running an A-B test on compositions, um, colors, things like that. Um, and that way, before you run PPO, you can get a sense of how it does. Because I have a slide on PPO too, and it's kind of limited like the benchmarks are and what it can tell you, but you can use these, this data from ASA to do some A-B testing too. And then obviously making paid UA efficient. Um, screenshots have to be relevant to searches, apps have features, features have demographics, everybody wants something different. So making funnels for all of these users, for all of the things that you do, um, it's no longer like a one size fits all, catch all type thing. All right, PPO. Um, how many of you have run PPO tests before? Okay. Um, they're good, and they actually got better. Um, Apple quietly, when they released those $3,500 goggles, made a change to the App Store. Um, so you no longer have to stop tests automatically uh, when you have new builds. So that was a big thing. That was an issue with PPO when it came out. So you can keep running them as long as you need to get the data. You wouldn't want to run it too long. Um, long enough to get week over week trends so you're not doing something for just a few days, but not for like several months where the data becomes irrelevant because new trends happen. Um, <clears throat> but technically you could if you, <laughs> if you want to now. Um, so this is better for high level conversion metrics so you can understand how your organic audience is responding to those screenshots, supplementing it with ASA testing. Because um, the ASA tests that you do don't have the PPO variant in it. So you can kind of hit it from those two fronts and get the different data sets. Just like with the benchmarks, this is going to tell you unique impression volume to total install volume, which is a different type of thing if you're trying to get new users and see how they respond. You're going to want to deploy the updates, run them through a PPO test to get some data back, but understand that if your app gets half of its traffic volume on re-downloads, then half of the data you're getting from the PPO is going to be on those types of users. So just like with all of this stuff, you want to know what it tells you and what it doesn't. Uh, test and validate. So run the PPO test, run an ASA campaign with a proxy to your organics, run a test there, then deploy and measure the impact before and after. And keep in mind if you change your traffic volume, how that may affect uh, user interaction. Like if you suddenly turn off all your Facebook and then you ramp up TikTok and you didn't have that before versus after, these audiences are gonna respond differently. So no wonder the testing is skewed. So you gotta make sure you know what you're looking at when you're looking at it. I think I've said that like five times, sorry. <laughs> um, and then considering the effect on ASA, these don't appear in ASA results. Um, once you do deploy it, let's say we have a test, it does 15% better um, on a PPO test. Then we deploy it and suddenly we see that Apple search ads, the CPI is going up, the TTR is going down. It could be that the default ad set for search ads with these new screenshots you've applied, users in those ad groups just aren't responding because they didn't see that when you were running the test because PPOs don't go to ASA. So you wanna make sure you keep an eye on not just all organic app analytics performance, but also how your ASA campaigns are doing. 
because you might need to make a custom product page for that ad group that is the old set because they responded better to it. So look at everything granularly and make sure you're not uh, missing anything. Not that that would be a problem because you're all going to be using CPPs anyway for your ad group. So hopefully that's uh, not even an issue. Um, GP promo content. Is anyone here part of the beta for promo content? Ooh, lucky. <laughs> yeah, so there's the beta for the promo content. It's going to be opening up um, later this year. It's supposed to be around the end of the month. We were the early initial reports, but later this year, this is going to be opening up to everybody. Um, it's, it's kind of like in-app events, but arguably more important than in-app events. So... It can include events, offers, major updates. Um, there's also crossover collabs is a section that they let you do. Um, so why I'm saying is it more important, dramatic pause, why I'm saying is it more important um, is because it can show up like this, and I'm sure you've seen this if you have an Android. In search results, you get the organic results. This is a feature-based keyword that would go into Explore. And then limited time events show up kind of in the middle at the top of search results. So after this would be more organic search results, some ads are thrown in there uh, down below. But this is an opportunity to appear higher up in ranking without running a paid campaign like doing ASA uh, for a keyword that you're either not indexed in the top spot on, or you could be indexed at the top and then show up again here if you're running one of these events. So it's not the same as Apple, and that's why I put it's arguably more important because it's a way to either increase your search visibility or double it if you're already ranking one of those top spots and help defend it. Um, and also the passive visibility, if organic is the active visibility where I'm searching for bingo because I want to play bingo, uh, the passive one would be like being on the For You tab and just checking out what's there. Um, it's kind of like checking out the Apps and Games tab in Apple where you just like are browsing content. So, um, But yeah, this is a great way to be repeated in search results towards the top um, or show up in a place you didn't before without increasing ad spend. And custom store listings. So um, <clears throat> this one is different than the um, custom product pages on Apple where you can do a custom store listing tied to different languages, either by territory or by URL. Um, there are going to be letting you do this for Google Ads. Um, they announced a Google I.O. in the future, in the near future, but sometimes Google says coming out in the second half of whatever year it is, is on December 31st, so <laughs> we'll see when they do it. Um, it's a new, uh, the new thing here, I think, they have some new categorization that you can do and ways that you can duplicate it just to make it easier to do it, but I think the biggest new thing is the re-engagement potential, and it's just another thing that both st stores are doing that is about re-engaging people, increasing uh, interaction and activation. So you can make custom store listings to target lapsed users. Um, it's a new thing that they're doing. Um, if you haven't already, go to the custom store listing page in the dev console, and then you can apply to be part of the beta program. They're still, I checked this morning because I didn't want to do this talk and tell you guys to go look, and then it's not there. So they're still accepting people as of this morning um, if you want to go look. Um, but this is a good way where you can automatically drive lapsed users who haven't used your app for the last 30 days or deleted it um, and show them something new, just like the Hulu and Netflix example. Um, just like with CPPs and in-app events, making a unique URL from these custom store listings, driving traffic to it. Um, I mentioned like keywords and creatives were general foundational basic concepts. Making custom store listings and custom product pages is becoming one of those basic things that you need to do in this new ASO era. So make sure you're doing that for your paid campaigns too, running tests on it, all that. Um, you can run more experiments too. So it's not limited to just five tests anymore. You can set up these custom product pages with different languages um, and you can run uh, significantly more. Like technically you can run up to 50 if you're running external traffic campaigns and you want to run A-B tests to see how they convert, you can set up experiments that go to the URL that you're only sending that subset of your traffic, and you can just run all these A-B tests on the store with that. Um, that's, of course, if you have enough volume to do that. You don't want to be driving a minimal amount of traffic. 
Um, you could technically do it on every territory, but if you're only getting like 10 downloads a day in one territory with one set of language, like maybe don't do that because it doesn't have StatSig data back. So um, look at where your volume is and where you can test and the different channels it's coming in from, and then make sure you're testing there. Um, AI, has anyone used the new AI tool that Google has? Good, it's bad. Um, so <laughs> the AI helper from Google, um, this isn't like using chat GPT or Bard, I guess it would be. Um, you can go to the custom product, custom store listings area, um, and it uses your main product page to generate a different take on it. You tell it the theme you want, the tone you want, and the audience you want, and it'll give you a version of your short and full description uh, with those adjustments in mind. Um, I tried making this several times. Most of the time it said, try again later, so let's start there. Um, but it doesn't generate copy based on where you currently rank for keywords. That's not a part of it. Past experiment performance, like when we're making new assets, we wanna take the learnings from past experiments we did, bring them over to the next thing. Um, this simply takes the criteria you Mad Libs into it and makes a description with it. Um, <laughs> Google Play's compliance guidelines. Um, I made this and it generated text that is in violation of Google's own guidelines. So uh, it doesn't have that built in just yet. Um, and then the accuracy to your feature set, there's a disclaimer that please read this over because the generated content may not be accurate for your app. Um, but it's, I think, the sign of the start of something where this is going to become more useful in its current state. It's not really there. Um, you can generate it, read it over. You might get some ideas on things you may not have thought about before. But always think about these factors, like where do I rank? What do I want to try to target? How did my past experiments around this do? Um, I mean, it made some straight up illegal text when I was doing it told me, uh, this app will tell you financial advice on how to invest. I'm like, you probably shouldn't be saying that. Just... So like, it, yeah, it's, um, it's something to look at for ideas and drawing from, but it's not quite fully like AI doing ASO for you by any means yet. But it's just like anything, know what it is and know what it isn't and use it to your advantage. So on the iOS App Store, how to measure and improve. Keyword ranking, impression volume, first time downloads, like core basic stuff has not gone away. Still key to track, top funnel. Uh, modern ASO, look at your benchmark conversion metrics, understanding that that includes re-downloads and total downloads. Um, your in-app event setup and the reported metrics, think about how long your app has been in the store. Look at other in-app events that you've run. Don't just run one think that the performance is lackluster and kind of stop doing it. Um, run 10 of them and use that as your benchmark for the next one. Make a few adjustments. It varies from app to app based on your traffic volume, the age of the app, your category. Um, so run these tests. It's new. It's the way the stores are going. Definitely do it. Um, do A-B testing validation metrics beyond just product page optimization. Deploy, look at app analytics, dissect it by territory, new versus re-downloads, how's it doing? Understand if you change your traffic, uh, how that may affect the results. And then um, look at your store setup and your paid UA KPIs. Um, when I make these changes, how does that affect my different paid channels? Um, because everybody has to eventually go to this page to download. And if I ran a PPO test and applied it, do my different traffic channels respond in different ways to this? So look at all of these things. This is ASO. ASO is not keywords. <laughs> this is ASO. Um, and it's going to just keep going that way. There's going to be more things to do. It looks like the stores are going towards um, top funnel, as it has been known, to engagement and re-engagement. Um, so those have to be part of your strategy. Google Play, a lot of this is similar. Keywords, visitor volume, store listing acquisition volume, still key to track. The way that you track it is different. The way that you look at year-over-year -year benchmarks is different because Google changed their data. I mean, they wiped it in 2020, and then they changed it in uh, November last year, and then in February again. So all traffic channel data in aggregate is pretty good to get your seasonality benchmark. But if you're trying to separate the traffic sources, know when things changed and what changed. Otherwise, it's going to give you false positives or negatives. Um, 
Google's had benchmark conversion metrics by traffic source. So unlike Apple, you can look at countries and traffic sources when you're getting the conversion benchmarks. Um, still look at those. Those are still really important to know how you're doing versus the competitors. Um, but mainly see if you deploy something and how that affects your app. A lot of uh, best practice for ASO is knowing what's there, but also running your own tests, seeing if you've improved based on where you were last year or where you were a month ago, um, and not comparing only like if you're doing better on the benchmark. It's really like, is my app improving and knowing why it's improving? Um, setting up your promo content, it's so the technical aspects that you have to do to prepare for that. Um, I think it might have been about a year and a half ago now where Google came out with those new guidelines where you couldn't put free in the title and the developer name and your icon and things like that. Um, they also put some suggestions in that you don't have to do, but they recommend. So if, uh, if you try to run promotional content and you're not compliant to the recommendation guidelines, they may reject that promo content because you're not eligible for promotion across Google Play if you're in violation of that. Um, so make sure you're cleaned up and there's no flags being thrown that haven't been a problem uh, over the last year because they could start to become a problem once you try to do this. Um, the same goes with your crashes and ANRs. Google's changed it from um, why is my phone so hot in my pocket because you don't know what's going on. Like, now it's user-facing crashes and ANRs. So if those spike up, your featuring placement can be diminished, your keyword ranking can be diminished. So make sure you're looking at those uh, factors too. Um, so yeah, the promo content, I think once that opens up, it's gonna be a big change on Google Play for sure. Uh, so stores have evolved, evolve your ASO with it. Um, yeah, a lot of this is about the presentations of the store and why they're changing. Um, I think they're changing because Apple and Google have been around for a decade. They're trying to get people to re-engage with apps that have been around for that long. Um, but the core things in new apps, there's still viable strategies to do, so make sure you're doing that as a base and building on it. Um, it's not a growth hack, it's a requirement. Um, this isn't like the 255 character title days. Um, you have to do ASO, there's no like quick hack stuff. This is all fundamental stuff to get users. Um, the modern data and strategies, knowing what's there, knowing what it means, knowing what it doesn't mean, and then making sure you're looking at the right data. Um, and make sure you have a quality app behind it too. Google looks at these quality factors like crashes, ANRs, those benchmarks. Um, they consider um, if you're using the latest material design when they're promoting your app, so making sure you're following all those guidelines is critical. Um, so don't get stuck in the past. Take a modern approach to ASO. Thanks.